children are leaving, uh, just uh, by way of refreshment, uh, where are we? Where are we at? You don't know? Okay. Genesis chapter four, right? Yeah. Okay. No. We are in the book of Luke. Luke. My Bible opened to Luke. No way. It didn't open to Thessalonians. <laughs> um, we're in Luke, and. Any particular word come to mind on chapter 1 of Luke, uh, the concept of what chapter 1 is in relation to Jesus? Okay. It's what? Yeah. No. Uh, it is the prequel to the Christmas story. Chapter 1 of Luke is the prequel to the Christmas story. The Christmas story is in Luke chapter, I'll give you a hint, chapter 3, I mean chapter 2. Um, so Luke, remember in the first four verses, is, is telling the story of Jesus. And if you're going to tell the story of Jesus, what do you have to include? And that's kind of a, if you think about it, it's like one person going into a restaurant and ordering everything on the menu. It's like there's a, there's a lot to choose from, and you've got to start somewhere. So Luke begins with the, uh, the guy who is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Jesus being the Messiah. This is his story. And so he gives us, if you remember, the story of Elizabeth and Zacharias. <clears throat> Elizabeth and Zacharias were what kind of people? Righteous. They were righteous. Old. Old. <laughs> they were old, righteous people. <laughs> Some of you should have an affinity with that. <laughs> no? Okay. Part of it. Yeah, part of it. <laughs> well, some of you will get to be old. Uh, I appreciate the righteousness in this, in this body. Um, and today we're going to be in, in uh, the final portion of chapter 1, what is uh, called the... the Benedictus, and I'll explain what that is, uh, the last portion of Luke 1. But the Benedictus is associated or related to what, has, what we've already heard. And the big thing here is when Gabriel shows up and talks with Zecharias in the temple and tells him, hey, you and your wife are... The, it's all done. You guys are going to get pregnant. And he's going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. <coughs> and my words, isn't that great? And you remember Zechariah <clears throat> responded by saying, I on my part am an old man. So what sign are you going to give uh, so that I know this is true? And Gabriel's response was, well, I on my part am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And you're going to be mute from now on until this thing happens. And so we ended up with the story then of Elizabeth actually getting pregnant and, and uh, Mary having her encounter with Gabriel and her response was, "Lo, well, let it be done to me exactly as you have said. And then Mary leaves and uh, or Elizabeth gives her response to Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to Mary in her new pregnancy. And then Mary gives a response, and it shows the heart of the mother of Jesus as being a, an unbelievably righteous woman, and soon to be mother, and uh, what was called the Magnificat. And uh, she gives glory to God on all that is happening to her and all that's going to happen because of her. Then we got into verse 57 and following, where Elizabeth actually then gives birth, and uh, everybody in the neighborhood is just ex excited for this 
And, and this has to hit you for this old woman who is now a mother. And I realize that some of us know people who have had their families and the kids are heading off to college and war and all of a sudden mom's pregnant again. Well, I think this would be almost like the kids have gone off to college, off to war, they've come home, they've started families, they've started jobs, they've started their own children, and then mom, who is now grandma, gets pregnant. That's what is so powerful about all of this. And the neighbors come in and they're, they're excited and they rejoice with her in verse 58 uh, that God has shown his mercy upon her who has been barren her whole life. And the child is born on the eighth day. They're going to name him. <coughs> Everybody's ready to uh, honor the father, Zacharias, by naming the child Zacharias. And mom says, uh, in fact, it's funny how Luke says it. He says, the child's mother, his mother, says. He doesn't, Luke doesn't say Elizabeth, he says, and John's mother <laughs> says, no way. You're going to call him John. And nobody will accept that, because after all, she's only the mother. So they go to dad, and the way Luke writes it in the, uh, in the tenses is they come in and like, Zacharias, right? And uh, Zacharias, as you remember, calls for a tablet, and he writes down, his name will be John. And as soon as he does that, his mouth opens, his voice is loosened, and he begins praising God. And we need to begin today with the last part of that, which we've already covered, but I'm going to read it again. Verse 64, chapter 1. And at once Zechariah's mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. And fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them kept them in mind, saying, what then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. And we, we begin today then with verse 67, but having to connect it with this story continues, and the people are all wide-eyed, their jaws are dropped, all the things that have taken place so far, all the, uh, the power of God evident, the mercy of God evident, people's lives literally changed already, an old woman pregnant, an old man the father, and uh, the hand of God upon him because by uh, the hand of God, Zechariah hasn't spoken until this very moment. And that's where we go today in verse 67. Uh, Zechariah prophesies the great deeds of God. <clears throat> and uh, I, as I looked at this, and I really wanted to finish out Luke uh, 1 today, and, and after I began to unfold what is called the Benedictus, I said, there's no way. There's too much here. Verse 67, and his father, Zechariah. So John, who is going to be called John the Baptist, uh, John, who is the forerunner of the Messiah, his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. We don't even need to go any further for a few months. Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already seen that John, who, as soon as he was conceived, Gabriel said he's going to be filled with the Spirit while yet in his mother's womb and responded to just the voice of the one who was carrying the Messiah. And then we found that Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit as she ministered to Mary. And now we find that Zechariah is filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> but there's a different purpose here than for uh, John, who is literally eight days old, and of Elizabeth, Zechariah has the job of prophesying. So what is happening here in the conclusion of chapter 1 is that Zechariah is given a, uh, a task 
by the Holy Spirit so that as Zacharias is opening his mouth, it is the influence and movement of the Holy Spirit himself who is moving and, how do you say, uh, instigating the words that are coming out. Uh, sometimes it's not so much that I have a quote-unquote feeling that I'm filled with the Spirit, but I'm very aware that at times when I had prepared to say something and I never even get it because the Lord, the Holy Spirit, has moved my mind in another direction and that's where I'm supposed to go because you didn't need to hear what I had written down. You needed to hear what the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear. And guess who is the instrument of that? Now, there's two aspects of prophesying. And you've heard me say this before, but it bears very much uh, impact on this. One is simply what I do. I prophesy. That is to say, I tell forth the truth. This is already done. This is complete. The, the scriptures are complete. Bumper to bumper. Genesis to Revelation, it's complete. I don't need to add anything to it. But my task as a shepherd, as an under-shepherd of the master, is to tell you what God has revealed already. And how often have you read the scriptures and walked away scratching your head saying, I don't, I don't get it. Well, you've heard me say it before, that everything in here has a purpose. And so sometimes it's even difficult for me, and I scratch my head and say, okay, God, I've got to preach this, and I have no idea what you're talking about. So give me what I need to share so that the people can understand what you want them to know. So there's that aspect of prophesying, simply forth telling truth. The other aspect of prophecy is, of course, telling the future. God doesn't give us the future except as he has given us the future. Um, <clears throat> the book of the Revelation is the future. Now, a little bit of it is, in the, is the past because John is dead and all those churches named are done, but there's so much in the future, uh, the future kingdom of Jesus and uh, heaven and the new heaven, new earth and all that. So what is going to happen here in this uh, Benedictus is that Zecharias, from the standpoint of pre-Messiah, okay, Christmas, obviously the Messiah is in Mary's womb, so he's walking about through her legs, but um, he's not going to show up until Christmas. So Zacharias, prior to the arrival of the Messiah, is telling in advance who he is and what God is doing right now. He, God, God's plan is in action right now, is what Zacharias is going to tell us in the Benedictus. So verse 67 uh, and John's father, Zecharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And this is what he said. So we don't want to miss, as we look at this, uh, which, again, and I, I shared this with regards to the Magnificat, that in preparation for Christmas, we simply give, kind of give a head nod to this, or it's like a bunch of uh, uh, words, and I just want to read them quick so I can get to the good stuff. But everything in here is powerful. And it begins with the very first word, blessed. Now, you remember the Magnificat was called the Magnificat because in the Greek, the word is the first word in the sentence. And the Latin uh, word is Magnificat. That's the translation from the Greek. Well, here it's the same thing. The first thing out of Zechariah's mouth is blessed. Well, what is blessed? Blessed is that word which you've heard me tell you before, uh, eulageo. Eulageo is a eulogy. And what is a eulogy? A eulogy is a good word. And in the Latin, 
The word for good is bene, and the word for word is or speech is uh, dictus. And you can you can hear those in like benefit, um, beneficent, all those kind of things. And so what we have in the Benedictus, and when we're done, and uh, you usually hear Bob give a benediction. Well, what is that? That's a good word. That's a that's a uh, a blessing. Um, that's a benediction. So. Uh, as you look at that and realize this is called the benedictus, which is a good word, which is a eulogy, which is a, a blessing, we realize that uh, Zechariah is, because his next words are, blessed uh, be the Lord God of Israel. So the good word, or the benediction from Zechariah's heart is lifted up into the face of God. While I was uh, in the Northwest, um, I have a lot more books that are on my shelf, and I opened up my uh, computer and opened up one of my books, which was uh, Tozer's book. You ever heard of A.W. Tozer? A.W. Tozer is an amazing man, and um, honestly, there's there's so many. I, I looked at all the titles I had, and I picked the one on um, uh, on God. And uh, I, was, I was so convicted by the first chapter that I quit reading. <laughs> it's only tongue in cheek, mostly because I put my computer away and I never took it out again. But um, while I was reading that chapter, I was so convicted that most of us really don't pay attention to God. We, we really don't. We, uh, he's, he's there, we know it. Um, but we, and I don't, uh, this isn't a judgment, but uh, we oftentimes treat God as a, as a Santa Claus, and so we, when we're in time of need, we pray. That's a little bit of that tongue-in-cheek when I said, I'm going to blackmail you. This church offered me the pastor position. <laughs> better be praying. Um, and so we, uh, we oftentimes look at God in a different manner than really he should be looked at as the ever-existent one who is present today and, and the whole matter of, of uh, who he is is reflected out in us. And the reason that you would be considered a good person isn't because you're a good person, it's because he's been making you a good person. Uh, his goodness is reflected out of you and, and the joy, and I've already told you this from the uh, Fruit of the Spirit, Jesus left us a legacy of love, joy, and peace. And that love, joy, and peace that we have is really a reflection from out of him to us into the world. I mean, it's crazy good stuff, and we too often forget who God is. And uh, Tozer, the book kind of begins where Tozer spends, you know, the first hours of the day on his knees, on his face before God. And it's like, I think I did that once. <laughs> so, like I said, convicted. Well, right out the gate... Zechariah says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Just a reminder that when we see the word Lord, there is the aspect of master. But as we read it almost exclusively, though not so, in Luke, it doesn't refer to the master. It refers to what the um, Greek translation of the Hebrew takes God's name, Yahweh, and translates it into the Greek word kurios, which is Lord. So when we look at this, we're actually look at, looking at blessed be Yahweh Elohim of Israel. And so Zechariah isn't giving us New Testament theology. He's taking from everything you've read in the Old Testament, from in the beginning God created, to the discussion with Adam, to the discussion with Noah, to the discussion with Abraham, to the promises made to David, to the prophecies made through all the prophets. He's taking that God whom we know, and he's saying, good word, eulogy, blessed be him, Yahweh, Elohim of Israel. 
obviously being a Jew, he's going to say that because who is Yahweh? Well, he's the God of the world, but he chose, and that comes out uh, later, which obviously, just looking at the clock, I'm not going to even get as far as I thought I would, uh, which is fine. We don't have to finish today. Um, is the Hebrew people. Israel is whom we would call the Jews. Who was the first Hebrew? Who was the first Jew? It was Abraham, uh, Father Abraham. Um, and Abraham was the beginning of the chosen race. We'll get to that, if not today, then next week. So when he says the um, Lord God of Israel, it's a uh, matter that it includes all the history and blessing of what you basically read in the Old Testament. So right out the gate, the Benedictus, the benediction, the good word, the eulogy, the blessing, Zechariah begins with God. Now, let's just stop and think for a moment. What would have happened in this story if right out the gate, as soon as Gabriel said, your wife is no longer going to be barren, you're going to become a daddy. If Zacharias had said, praise, let's see, I'm an old man, praise God. <laughs> Instead of, uh, question. So, Zechariah could have, should have, and I suppose if he had known his future, would have praised God immediately, but he didn't. He questioned God. So, uh, this is what should have happened as soon as Gabriel shows up. Um, then we find that what has been developing in Zechariah's heart for nine months, because remember, he went home, Shortly after he went home, lo and behold, Elizabeth is pregnant. And so for nine months, Zechariah has in his mind and in his heart been working through the words of Gabriel, been working through the whole Old Testament, on, and especially that portion in Isaiah where there's a forerunner. And lo and behold, from his loins, comes the forerunner carried about in his wife's, Elizabeth's womb. So can you imagine that for nine months, since you really couldn't carry on a conversation with your neighbors, all you could do is really think, and if it was really important, you'd write it down, milk, butter, <laughs> eggs, bread. bread. Um, if it was really important, you write it down, but a lot of reflection time. There's not a whole lot of teaching coming from Zacharias's lips in the synagogue these days. So for nine months, he's had a chance to cogitate. And therefore, what has been mellowing, developing inside in a burst of the Holy Spirit's filling comes out, and the first thing out of his mouth is praise the Lord. Third, we understand that when he was filled with the Spirit, this is like the Old Testament type of filling, so it's incident specific. Uh, you and I live in the New Testament age. We live in what is called the church age. If you have named the name of Jesus Christ as your Savior, if he is your God, and you recognize that there's only one way to into the presence of God on the good side uh, is through Jesus, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. You are indwelt. He lives in you. God lives in you. You have been invaded. I hope that's okay. But in the Old Testament, and now, it's incident specific. And so the Holy Spirit comes at a specific time, at a, to a specific person, and something very specific happens in that arena. So what would happen this morning if I was Zacharias and I and this incident was happening right here, it, this is the impact right here. 
because nobody in the other churches in the area would have this. Okay, so it's incident specific. And what we need to realize in this account is that Zechariah becomes the mouthpiece of God. So what we're going to see here in verse 68, 69, down through 79, is that Zechariah, just like an Old Testament prophet, is very specifically giving information. I was going to say instruction, uh, but I don't really remember that there's any instruction in this. So it's information. But it's important information because, remember, the Christmas story isn't until chapter 2. So there's a lot to happen yet. Six months, six months, three months. Uh, yes, I, I can't do the math. Anyway, in about six months, Mary's going to give birth. Okay, so in about six months, um, Jesus is going to be born. But until that time, hearts are going to be uh, having to cogitate on this. So here's here's a uh, application question. Because we've already learned from Zechariah's life, what if he had said yes to God the moment Gabriel revealed it to him? Instead of saying, excuse me, I don't really believe you, because I know me. What if he had said yes? So the question is, what about you? And the answer is, just say yes to God. Makes for a shorter line. <laughs> Remember the 40 years in the wilderness? <laughs> ah, 40 years later. Here we are, right back where we started. So, just say yes to God. The second part. Why is, uh, verse 68, the second part. Why did he begin this way? Because God has done three things. First of all, he has visited us. Second of all, he's accomplished redemption for his people. Third, he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Those three things. And I think we've got time to deal with that. So, uh, from the mouth of the words um, comes, God visited us. The word visited, as you can see there, D on your sheets, comes from the um, Hebrew. And it refers, of course, to God to visit with gracious interposition. God looks with favor. God looks with concern. God is eager to help. That's what the visitation means. And if I'm going to put this together, uh, even though I'm not done with the three yet, is that man needs help. Man in his position right from the get-go, Adam and Eve, what happened? They covered themselves with uh, fig leaves and God covered them with an animal skin because man had a need. In our sinful condition, man had a need. Well, God is concerned about that. God is eager to help in that. So the first thing of praise is that he looked upon, uh, and that would be look upon with favor, or he has visited us. Again, with favor. And he has wrought or accomplished or brought about something. The English word that is typically used is redemption. Uh, redemption is a fine word, but it uh, sometimes falls short of the original thought of ransom. See, ransom is a payment made to give freedom to the ransomed one. And this redemption, we think of buying back. Well, ransom uh, covers the same thing, but I, I, in my mind anyway, it's a, it's a uh, <coughs> more specific word. God is going to accomplish or bring about uh, ransoming. He's going to pay the price to cover that which he sees, that which we need help in. Uh, in order to accomplish. So we have three things. He visited or looked upon us, and he brought about or he wrought or he uh, accomplished ransoming for his people, and 
in verse 69, the third of the three, he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the home or from the house of his servant David. The raising up is uh, the raising up is is the uh, the horn of deliverance. Okay. I'm going to turn back, and you can too if you want, to Psalm 132. Psalm 132. And there's a portion, I'm not going to read the whole portion, uh, but Psalm 132 is an amazing passage about Jesus. And I'm just going to read verse 13, and then I'm going to read verse 17, but the whole passage there is good. So Psalm 132, verse 13, For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his habitation, and it goes on with that. And then in verse 17, there, that is in Zion, I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. The horn of David. I, I, I have them. I just thought due to lack of time, I won't read them all. Um, the horn is the picture of strength. Uh, whenever it comes to the horn of David or the horn of deliverance or the horn of salvation, it's always a singular. It's not plural. Uh, you can find horns in the scripture, but it's uh, referring to that which uh, comes out from uh, a cow or a, a bull. Uh, so the horn is a singular. The horn of David very specifically would end up being Jesus, who would be the strong one uh, uh, for Israel. The, um, <clears throat> the horn would be the root, the shoot, that comes from the house of David. The, uh, what is this horn offering? Well, it's the horn of salvation. Now, I'm going to turn quickly to Acts chapter 7, verse 25. I thought I had it with a piece of paper, but I didn't. Acts 7.25, just a reminder that I dealt with this in the book of Philippians, and I'll tell you how I did that in a moment. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 25, And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. And he's referring to Moses. Um, and notice that it's translated as deliverance, but it's the same word as salvation. Uh, when we dealt with it in, in uh, Philippians, I think every translation translates the first as deliverance and the second as salvation, and it shouldn't do that. They should both de be deliverance. So you think in terms of salvation as deliverance. Why is that important? Well, I'm going to turn to uh, what I opened with this morning in Isaiah chapter 59. That's where I uh, read that verse. Isaiah 59, that's Jeremiah, I don't want Jeremiah. In Isaiah 59, in verse 1, that's what I read. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. So God knows, God cares, God is watching, God is trying to interact. But And then the passage continues, and I'm only going to read verse 2, but there's more, and it's... Bad. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. So the sadness in the Isaiah passage, and it goes from bad to worse, although that's bad enough that God isn't going to listen because your iniquities are there, is that God wants to interact. God does care. But we constantly do this in our rebellion against him, or that's what, that was our way of life. And we said, uh, the cross, just burn them all. Uh, Jesus was just a, he was a deceived dude. And on it goes. Um, we have a problem, and it's a sin problem. The only way to <laughs> remedy that, because it's a spiritual condition, that leads to physical acts is that it needs to be taken care of spiritually. And so that's what this is. All 
about the story that Luke is giving us and the prophecy that he gives us in Luke 1 from Zechariah all talks about the salvation, the redemption, the ransoming, the deliverance that God is offering through the Messiah, who hasn't even shown up on the scene yet. There's one thing I need to mention in these three things, and then I think I'm going to call it for today, is that you'll notice in your notes that when it says he looked upon or he visited, it's in the red. That he wrought or he accomplished or he brought about, that is in the red. That he raised up uh, a horn of salvation that's in the red. That's the aorist tense. That, if you remember me saying hundreds of times, it's a one-time act or it's a historical act. Well, keep in mind, those things haven't happened yet since the Messiah still is housed in Mary's womb. So how can these things be historical statements? Well, this is a prophecy, remember. And so what Zacharias is doing by the power of the Holy Spirit is to tell everyone who's going to listen that this is going to happen. And it's like it hasn't happened yet, but it's like it has happened because that's God's plan and it cannot be stopped. Does that make sense? So it's a historical, it's a, sorry, it's a prophetic aorist. It hasn't been accomplished in our time yet, but it's been accomplished in the mind of God. And it's a part of his plan, so it's going to happen. All right, so today, we didn't get very far. I thought I would get actually further than I did. Big surprise. Uh, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit for this event. And so if you want to finish chapter uh, one this week in your reading, uh, just ask yourself some questions on, huh, uh, he said that, and Wayne explained that. But what are some of these other things? And uh, I, that'll help uh, as we move forward to conclude chapter 1. Father, uh, there's, there's so many challenges here. And some of the beauty is simply to, to um, recognize what you have accomplished. We're reading this from the lips of a man who lived 2,000 years ago. And the events themselves in that period of two millennia are uh, so squished together back there that everything we're looking at has been accomplished. And yet they hadn't been accomplished when Zacharias opened his mouth. So we see here many beautiful things that were for the time of Zacharias, but they're just as pertinent for us today in our appreciation for your plan and all that you've already accomplished and you will continue to do. Father, may we say yes to you uh, this week, much more often than we say no. May we be sensitive to uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. May we be willing to submit and move forward so that you can accomplish what you desire to accomplish in us and through us. We commit our way to you in the precious name of the Master, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.